Today on Public Eye News, a car crashes into police barricades at the U.S. Capitol and Michigan reports a case of a COVID-19 virus variant identified in Brazil. Later in the show, I will have your weather and Devontae Stein will be back for your sports update. Hi, I'm Max Stevens. And I'm Joseph Sigourney and this is Public Eye News. The City of Marquette's winter parking ban is over as of yesterday, April 1st, with drivers able to park overnight in unrestricted spaces on city streets. The police department also reminds that vehicles can no longer be parked on front yards or block right-of-way areas such as driveways and sidewalks. Those parking options were allowed under city authorization during the winter season. Market City Police Captain Mike Lura is also reminding residents that overnight parking ban may be enforced again during the unusual snow events this spring. The Federal Aviation Administration's latest program is geared towards improving airport infrastructure across the country, and that includes Sawyer International and the Delta County Airport. Each will receive grants of more than $5 million as part of the FAA's Airport Improvement Program. The funding goes towards maintaining the taxiway and lighting the Delta County Airport, plus refining the expanded hangar building at Sawyer International. The FAA explained at the core that the project's goals are able to create jobs and help ensure the sustainability of regional airline service for local communities. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources is advising canoeists, kayakers, and anglers of changing outflow conditions at the mouth of Dead River at Lake Superior and Marquette. The river is flowing toward the Lake Superior and Ishiming Railroad ore dock and Marquette's Upper Harbor, where Great Lakes freighters dock to load taconite pellets. The river's current at the river mouth may direct boaters toward interaction with the iron ore freighters. Paddlers and other boaters are urged to use caution in the area to avoid the freighters. Cleveland Cliffs Incorporated has notified additional partners in this effort to advise the boating public about this safety concern, including the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the City of Marquette. In spite of the challenges presented by the COVID pandemic last year, the Michigan DNR was able to conduct 220 surveys of inland fisheries. 125 surveys were conducted on inland lakes and the remaining 95 were conducted on streams. According to Jim, Jim Dexter, DNR Fisheries Division Chief, the purpose of each survey is to either evaluate management actions, understand the status or trends of a fishery, or find answers to questions or concerns about a fishery. Throughout the months of April and May, the DNR will be offering virtual conversations and coffee meetings, providing an informal opportunity to connect with local fisheries biologists and managers and get your questions answered about the work they do. The state of Michigan is experiencing the worst COVID surge of any state in the country right now, and just yesterday, the state confirmed its first case of a new variant first identified in Brazil. Michigan already has the second most cases of the UK variant, and there are new concerns that this Brazil variant may reinfect people who have already had COVID-19. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services is encouraging residents to continue to social distance and wear masks as the Whitmer administration continues to emphasize getting as many residents vaccinated as possible. As it stands currently, just over a third of Michigan residents over the age of 16 have received at least one vaccine shot. And the high school sports advocacy group Let Them Play Michigan has filed a lawsuit against the state of Michigan challenging the new requirement for teen athletes to be tested for COVID. Nearly two weeks ago, Governor Whitmer and the state health department announced the required rapid testing as a way to help curb the fastest climbing case rate in the country. The order requires 13 to 19 year old athletes in contact sports to be tested once a week if they can wear masks during play and up to three times a week if masks cannot be worn. The suit alleges that a state order and related guidances were not issued in compliance with procedural requirements and that they violate due process rights. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has declined to comment on the complaint. Don't touch that dial after this break. We'll be back with your national and international news. Coming up on Austin City Limits. Saturday night at 11. Welcome back. 
If you're itching for travel, you'll be excited to know that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention updated its guidance to say fully vaccinated people can travel within the U.S. without getting tested for the coronavirus or going into quarantine afterwards. Previously, the agency had cautioned against unnecessary travel even for vaccinated people, but noted that it would update its guidance as soon as more people got vaccinated and the evidence mounted about the protection the shots provide. Around 1.20 p.m. today, the Capitol Police opened fire at the north barricade of the U.S. Capitol complex after a suspect rammed their car into the police barricade. One officer is said to be injured and another one passed away en route to the hospital. Law enforcement sources tell the suspect is dead after they exited the vehicle with a weapon. It is still unknown if this was an intentional attack and investigators are actively trying to figure that out. Earlier today, 51 people were killed in a rail disaster in Taiwan after a passenger train crashed into a truck which had rolled over onto the tracks. The truck did not properly engage its emergency brake and slid 65 feet down a hillside, toppling over onto the tracks where the lead car of the train smashed into it a few minutes later. After the impact, the train derailed near the Taroko Gorge scenic area. This incident is the deadliest rail disaster in the island's history. And the Dutch government announced earlier today that it is temporarily halting the use of the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine for people under the age of 60, following reports of some people suffering from unusual blood clots after receiving the shot. Dutch Health Minister Hugo de Jong says the halt is temporary and a precautionary measure. The European Union Medicines Agency is set to deliver an update next week on the AstraZeneca vaccine. And state health leaders say one variant is taking over. Up to 60% of Minnesota's infections are now the B117 variant, first confirmed in the United Kingdom. Jeff Wagner is in Minneapolis with the latest. Like the warm spring sun shining over the Twin Cities, it's easy to feel that brighter days are ahead, especially for the many who just got a potentially life-saving shot in the arm. I've got a big old smile on under these two masks. Coming out and walking out with a vaccination card in my hand, it's inspiring. It feels like a step in the right direction. The rise in COVID vaccine allotment and widening of eligibility is a big step forward, but the steady rise in COVID cases feels like a step backward, one that gives Dr. Michael Osterholm great concern concern, especially as some states lift mask mandates and loosen restrictions. We've got a bad, bad virus. We've got a lot of people still yet who can be infected despite vaccines arriving. And we are now opening up as if somehow we're done with the virus. It's like we're dismissing gravity. Hospitalizations are rising in Minnesota as well. On March 1st, there were 251 people hospitalized with 60 in the ICU. On April 1st, it's up to 435 with more than 100 in the ICU. Another indicator of note is cases per 100,000 people. In mid-February, it was 13.1. Right now, it's 23.5, and that's a number not seen since the huge surge that started last October. We gotta hang together and get through this, but no, we're gonna see a surge of cases. How high, I don't know. I listen to the professionals that, that do the research, and if they say they're concerned, then I'm gonna be concerned as well. Optimism now being met with caution as the race to get vaccinated is now being tailed by a highly transmissible variant. Jeff Wagner, WCCO 4 News. The nation's employers went on a hiring spree in March, adding nearly a million jobs to the economy. Natalie Brand reports from Washington on the latest snapshot of the economy. California's Thunder Valley Casino and Resort is hiring on the spot. We're looking for over 40 guest room attendants, which full-time positions. We have 25 positions for our janitorial staff. With more people vaccinated and stimulus money fueling the economy, employers added 916,000 jobs last month, the biggest gain since last summer. The unemployment rate dipped to 6%. Job growth was widespread, with the biggest gains in leisure and hospitality, education and construction. Bankrate.com economic analyst Mark Hamrick. Yes, we had many thousands of jobs recovered in the leisure and hospitality segment, which has been the leading edge of job loss. But even with that, there's still 3 million jobs to recover there alone. The president this week unveiled a massive $2 trillion infrastructure proposal that the administration says will create millions of jobs. Hamrick says additional job creation will be needed when short-term economic relief programs run out. I do think it's very appropriate 
to have a conversation about what can we do to lift the performance of the U.S. economy over the long term. For some employers, the challenge is filling lower paying jobs. Wade Beckman's Texas restaurant is operating with half its usual staff. Our restaurants are getting busier and we're finding it really harder to find staff than we ever have. Even though there is a demand for workers, the economy is still about 9 million jobs short of pre-pandemic levels. Natalie Brand, CBS News, The White House. Stay tuned. After this break, we'll be back with your weather and sports. I'm Helena Bonham Carter. Both sets of my grandparents weren't conventional war heroes. She was always ahead of the game. She recognized what was happening to the Jews, and she was out there, active. He risked a lot in doing those visas. When you believe that something is morally wrong, you have to stand up and say so. My grandparents war. Sunday night at 8 on WNMU-TV. Welcome back to Public Eye News. I'm Max Stevens, going to be running you through your weather forecast for today. And as you can see behind me on the NMU Academic Mall, it is a gorgeous early spring afternoon here in the Upper Peninsula. Let's take a look now at our current... It's mostly sunny with a temperature of 49, winds out of the south at 16 miles per hour, and a barometric pressure at 30.31 inches and falling. Looking into tonight's conditions, we'll have overcast skies with a low around 37 and winds hanging steady out of the south at about 15 miles per hour. Tomorrow we'll see mostly sunny skies with highs hovering in the low 50s, winds north northeast at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Taking a look now across our gorgeous Upper Peninsula, it's sunny all across the UP. 41 up in Sault Ste. Marie, 41 in Manistique, 41 in Escanaba, and 45 down in Menominee. To shifting over to the western half of the UP. 48 in Iron Mountain, 49 in Ironwood, 51 in sunny up in Houghton, and of course back here in beautiful Marquette, 49 degrees. Sunny. Let's look now. Weekend and the early week ahead of us. Sunday, we'll have a high of 51, low of 37, and mostly cloudy skies. Monday, a high of 52, with low of 41, and cloudy skies. And Tuesday, it cools down a bit with a high of 46 and a low of 36, with a chance for some AM rain showers. Now, over to Devontae Stein with our sports. Thanks, Max. Checking out the action, our enemy Wildcats will be competing in this weekend. We have your volleyball team away tonight at rival Michigan Tech starting at 6 p.m. with another game against rival Michigan Tech coming home tomorrow starting at 4 p.m. Today and tomorrow, your men's golf team will be competing in the Kentucky Wesleyan Invite. Tomorrow, your outdoor track and field team will be competing in the Big Blue Alumni Invitational. Tomorrow the 3rd, the, your men's soccer team will be on the road taking on Upper Iowa with kickoff beginning at noon. Your women's soccer team will also kick off Saturday afternoon with the road game against Ashland at 1 p.m. Good luck, Wildcats. Earlier this week, NFL owners voted to increase the regular season from 16 games to 17. This is the first time since the 1978 season that the NFL has adjusted the season length when they increased it from 14 to 16. The NFL will shorten the preseason by one game and add that on to the end of the season so that the regular season will not run 18 weeks instead of 17. Each team will still only receive one bye week. The season will not start earlier but run longer, so the Super Bowl will no longer be on that first Sunday in February. Because of the season now being an odd number of games, some teams will not have nine games, while other teams will have eight home games. A proposal has been created to have all NFC teams have nine home games one season, and the next, the AFC would switch. This also puts an end to the infamous Jim Fish, J or, I'm sorry, Jeff Fisher 7-9 series, unless the team were to finish with a tie. The 17-game expansion will take place this upcoming 2021 season. Yesterday tipped off the start to the 2021 MLB season with the, with the Detroit Tigers started off with their best foot forward starting the year with a 3-2 home win over the Cleveland Indians. Only 8,000 fans were allowed out inside of Comerica Park for the game. Miguel Cabrera started off the season with a bang, homering his first at-bat of the year to put the Tigers up 2-0 in the first inning. Matthew Boyd got the start and win for Detroit with 5.2 innings pitched and just two strikeouts in the game. And that's all the time we have for you today in Public Eye News. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you again next week. The program was produced by WNMU-TV, Northern Michigan University Public Television, and studios located in Elizabeth and Edgar Hardin Hall.